Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Jesse Hassinger, and I'm the assistant manager and curator of the Poetry Book Club at the Odyssey Bookshops. Um, tonight's book is the February selection of the Poetry Book Club here, uh, and I am very pleased to be able to welcome in person Jose Olivares um, to read from uh, Promises of Gold, and uh, I see that he has his first book with him as well, so we'll probably get some poems from from that. Um, Jose Olivares is the son of Mexican immigrants. His debut book of poems, Citizen Illegal, was a finalist for the Penn Gene Stein Award and a winner of the 2018 Chicago Review of Books Poetry Prize. It was named a top book of 2018 by the Adroit Journal, NPR, and the New York Public Library, along with Felicia Chavez and Willie Perdomo. He co-edited the, the poetry anthology Breakbeat Poets, Volume 4, Latin Next. He co-hosts the poetry podcast, The Poetry Gods. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, welcome everyone here and everyone in the virtual world. Um, bit of a brief survey before we get going. Um, how did everyone hear about this event? Newsletter, social media, website? I don't see any hands. Teachers. All right, teachers. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that uh, that all of you can uh, sign up to be part of our newsletter. I'll pass this around um, and you can uh, sign up uh, your name and email address. You can be on the vanguard of knowing what's happening. Um, and uh, we'll just pass. If you want to sign up, do sign up, please. Um, we'll just add you to our, to our email list. We have a busy late winter, early spring, and some of the most upcoming events um, that we're looking forward to in person include tomorrow evening, Thursday, February 16th at 7 p.m. Mrs. Annie Anderson talks about her book, Brother Robert, Growing Up with Robert Johnson. She'll be enjoined in conversation by Timothy Erickson, an intimate memoir by blues legend Robert Johnson's stepsister, including new details about his family, music influences, tragic death, and musical afterlife. On Monday, February 27th at 7 p.m., Margot Duahi joins us in person to launch her new mystery, Scorched Grace. She will be joined in conversation by Deborah Jo Immergut. In this debut crime novel, Sister Holiday, a chain-smoking, heavily tattooed queer nun, puts her amateur sleuthing skills to the test. That's the exact reaction that, <laughs> that I get that every time. Uh, the following night, Tuesday, February 28th at 7 p.m., Jane Yolen will be with us to talk about her new collection of fairy tales, The Scarlet Circus. For a full list of events, and we have dates that go into May, um, authors and books, visit our website, odysseybks.com. You can register for all events as well as pre-order copies of the books there. Before we head into the meat of this evening, I would like to take a moment and reflect on the history of Turtle Island and the colonizing forces that changed the face of this land in modern history and have us reflect on what it means to be sitting here in 2023, especially as we are about to embark on an evening that will address what European and capitalist culture has wreaked on what is the American continents from the Canadian Northwest to Patagonia, dating back to the first colonizers through to our daily existence today. Depending on where one is located on these lands, there are different European cultures that have stolen and violently expelled many of the civilizations who called their lands home. The land that we are on this evening is the unceded land of the Pakumtuk and Nanaktuk nations. As current occupiers, we must understand the brutality of our colonizing ancestors in this occupation and realize what, that the Pakumtuk and Nanaktuk nations um, still do live in this area and uh, the area that has been named Western Massachusetts in the Connecticut River Valley. I wanna extend my gratitude to the peoples of the Pecumtuck and Anoktuck nations who still reside here, along with other native peoples who continue to display a manner of community kinship that has been lost to the capitalist industrial system. Speaking of that kinship, that is, always under, uh, that is always under threat from capitalism, white supremacy and state sh sanctioned violence in the closing poem to his first collection, Citizen Illegal, called Gentification, Jose Olivares writes directly about this. He begins, I plant a grain of sand in the new organic juice spot in Albario. 
Shortly, the grain of sand produces the culture that was excised by gentrification. The bad news is, he continues, the property value is going down again. Regardless, the culture continues to grow, bringing in with open arms our cousins in Mexico, in LA, in Texas. There are Mexicans in DC who get the call and the culture continues to come back to the whitewashed capitalist desert. The bad news is, he again continues, the economists say there is zero economic value on our block. The good news is we threw away the economic textbooks. We trade tortillas for haircuts, nopales for healthcare, poems for groceries. And if all you can do is eat the food, we ask that you wash your dishes. Olivares here is imagining an abolitionist future filled with community support, kinship, and love. For those of you familiar with the poem, you know that it doesn't end here, that La Migra comes because the, this demonstration of a community who refuses to take part in the capitalist hierarchy cannot be tolerated. But the reason why I quote from this poem tonight is that this first part of gentrification is a place where promises of gold exists. This book is filled with gorgeous, funny, and devastating poems centered on the love of community, culture, and kinship. In his introduction to the new book, Jose quotes Eduardo Galeano, which I think is the perfect way to lead into tonight's reading. Galeano wrote, Utopia is on the horizon. I move two steps closer, it moves two steps further away. I walk another 10 steps and the horizon runs 10 steps further away. As much as I may walk, I'll never reach it. So what's the point of utopia? The point is this, to keep walking. Please join me in welcoming Jose Olivares. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Guadalupe Olivares. Um, it is so good to be here tonight with all of you. Um, real quick, raise your hand if this is your first time going to a poetry reading. Is anybody new to this? Oh, no. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Excellent. Uh, cool. That's great. Um, well, uh, either way, what I want you to know is that we are in a bookstore. We're not in the library, right? And so you shouldn't feel like you have to stay quiet throughout. Um, I know some of you are familiar with Poetry Slam, and so... Uh, if you feel moved to make noise, you can make noise. Um, you won't get in trouble, I promise. Um, I'm going to start by reading a couple poems from Citizen Illegal and then transition to the promises of gold. Um, and what do I want to say? I want to say thank you to Odyssey Books for having me. And yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. Oh, the other thing I'll say is my plan is to read a few poems and then leave time for a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions... Uh, hold on to them. This poem is called Mexican American Disambiguation after Idris Goodwin. My parents are Mexican who are not to be confused with Mexican Americans or Chicanos. I am a Chicano from Chicago, which means I'm a Mexican American with a fancy college degree and a few tattoos. My parents are Mexican who are not to be confused with Mexicans still living in Mexico. Those Mexicans call themselves Mexicanos. White folks at parties call them pobrecitos. American colleges call them international students and diverse. My mom was white in Mexico and my dad was mestizo. And after they crossed the border, they became diverse and minorities and ethnic and exotic. But my parents call themselves Mexicanos, who again should not be confused for Mexicanos living in Mexico. Those Mexicanos might call my family gringos, which is the word my family calls white folks and white folks call my parents interracial. Colleges say, put them on a brochure. <laughs> my parents say, que significa esa palabra? I point out that all the men in my family marry lighter skinned women. That's the Chicano in me, which means it's the fancy college degrees in me, which is also diverse of me. Everything in me is diverse, even when I eat American foods like hamburgers, 
which to clarify, are American when a white person eats them and diverse when my family eats them. So much of America can be understood like this. My parents were undocumented when they came to this country. And by undocumented, I mean sin papeles. And by sin papeles, I mean royally fucked, which should not be confused with the American dream, though the two are cousins. Colleges are not looking for undocumented diversity. My dad became a citizen, which should not be confused with keys to the house. We were safe from deportation, which should not be confused with walking the plank, though they're cousins. I call that sociology, but that's just the Chicano in me who should not be confused with the diversity in me or the Mexicano in me who is constantly fighting with the upwardly mobile in me, who is good friends with the Mexican American in me, who the colleges love, but only on brochures, who the government calls non-white Hispanic or white Hispanic, whom my parents call mijo, even when I don't come home so much. All right, and then I thought uh, I would read Hentification since Jesse quoted from the poem uh, in the introduction. Um, Hentification is a poem that was inspired by my friend Nate Marshall. Uh, we were hanging out in Chicago uh, in a neighborhood that was gentrifying and Nate turned to me and he was like, yo, Jose, we're hentifying the neighborhood right now. <laughs> and uh, I had never heard that before. And so I was like, that's cool. So I tried to write a poem about it. Hentification. I plant a grain of sand in the new organic juice spot in El Barrio. Soon donkeys shit big stinky shits on carrot containers. Our tios y tias smoking cigarettes and taking up all the plugs. The grain of sand grows into a cactus and mi abuelita Jacinta is back with the living. She's kicking the juicers out of her kitchen and making masa. The whole block heard what's happening and outside the hydrants open and flood the streets. The bad news is the property value is going down again. The good news is my boy Nate is teaching poetry workshops in the shade. Gwendolyn Brooks smelled the tamales and came down to write. Rejoice in the good news. My dad comes, my dad comes through with the cooler of beer and no one gets drunk enough to fight. My mom's French braid gets longer every minute. Soon it will be long enough to toss to our cousins in Mexico, in LA, in Texas. There are Mexicans in DC who got the call. Salvadorans bringing pupusas. From the cactus, we get a steel mill. From the steel mill, we get more tortillas. The bad news is the economists say there is zero economic value on the block. The good news is we threw away the economics textbooks. We trade tortillas for haircuts, nopales for healthcare, poems for groceries. And if all you can do is eat the food, we ask that you wash your dishes. The donkeys bless everything that we grow. From the tortillas, we get more desert. And from the desert, we get low riders. Cars bounce. Our cousins and gangs get their bendiciones. The whole block is alive and not for sale. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo rescinded. It's happening on our block, and maybe it's happening on your block. The bad news is the president sends the National Reserve. The good news is they'll never find us. We pack everything into the trunk of a Toyota Corolla. When La Migra comes, their dogs bark and spit, but all they find is grains of sand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, I'm going to start with this poem. It's called Ode to Tortillas. And I wrote it because I was eating tortillas. And I was like, how come I haven't written about tortillas? It's such a central part of my daily life else yeah right uh and so it got me thinking about some other things and i wrote this poem ode to tortillas there's two ways to be a mexican writer that we've discovered so far you can be the mexican writer who writes about tortillas or you can be the mexican writer who writes about croissants <laughs> instead of the tortillas on their plate 
Can you be a Mexican writer if you're allergic to corn? There's two ways to be a Mexican writer that are true and tested. You can write about migration or you can write about migration. Can you be a Mexican writer if you never migrated, if your family never migrated? There's two ways to be a Mexican writer. You can translate from Spanish or you can translate to Spanish or you can refuse to translate altogether. There's only one wound in the Mexican writer's imagination, and it's the wound of the chancla. It's the wound of Bidia being sold out at the taco truck. It's the wound of too many dolores and not enough dollars. It can be argued that these are all chanclasos. Even death is a chanclaso. There's only one miracle gifted to Mexicans, and it is the miracle of never running out of cheap beer. It's the miracle of never running out of bad jokes. There's infinite ways to eat a tortilla, made in the ancient ways by hand and warmed in a comal, made with corn or with Taco Bell plastic. What about flour tortillas? Flour tortillas count if you ask San Antonio. <laughs> My people, I am poly with the tortillas. You can eat tortillas with your hands or roll them up and dip them in caldo like my mom does. You can eat them with a fork and knife like my bougie cousins do. What bougie cousins? I made them up for the purpose of this poem. You can eat tortillas and tacos or warmed up by microwave and drizzled with butter. Tortillas con arroz, tortillas con frijoles, tortillas con... Tortillas flipped by hand or tortillas flipped with a spatula. Tortillas with eggs for breakfast. Tortillas fried and sprinkled with sugar for dessert. Hard shell tortillas. Gluten-free tortillas for our mixed family. We are still discovering new ways to fold a tortilla, to cut a tortilla up, to transform a tortilla into new worlds, to feed each other with tortillas. My people, if I have children, I will teach them about tortillas but I'm sure they want McDonald's. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I write poems about my family a lot. Um, and when I write about my family, I try to make sure that I write about them, not just as like what their role in the family is, right? So I don't wanna just write poems about the ways my mom takes care of us. I wanna think about like, you know, what her dreams and hopes are outside of our family. So I wrote this poem, it's called An Almost Sonnet from My Mom's Almost Life. In the life where my mom never has kids, she doesn't mourn. She spends her 20s following Marco Antonio Solis, show to show, hands up in surrender, in praise to a different God than the one she spends Sundays kneeling to now. I love imagining her like this, her name Maria Maria, a name the men curse to the heavens from Guadalajara to Oaxaca, holy name of the mother, reborn a mother to none. She babies herself and maybe some lucky men, but only for a minute. Oh, I know my mom would protest. She would be bored without her family and God. My brothers blasting rap music in the basement, smoke reddening their eyes. Do our bellies of joy give joy to our maker? Reader, I'm a parent to nothing, not even a plant. All I know is those Saturday mornings, I've shared a coffee with my mom while love songs play on the radio and she stirs her coffee with their eyes closed, dreaming of a life where her slight smiles are her own and only her own. So that's one about my mom. I'll read you one I wrote from my dad. This one is called Regret or my dad says love. I was trying to look to see if I needed to give any further context, but I think that's it. It's for my dad. Regret or my dad says love. My dad never said regret 
but it hung from his lip like a cigarette. I remember that night in Mexico, my dad home with a little bit of money, diaspora dreamboat. In another life, he could have flirted with the whole bar. In this life, he was home by midnight, my baby brother sick on vacation. To be a dad is to be bossed at work and bossed at home. It's easy to daydream about love when it's a chorus of kisses. What about when love is a dirty diaper and a snot nose? My dad rarely said love, but he always left the bar. Um, so I, I wrote a lot of sonnets for this book in part because that's like all I had brain power for is the 14 lines of a sonnet. Um, so this is another sonnet. It's called Bad Mexican Sonnet. Sorry to my mom, the best Mexican I know, whose rosaries are worn down by the reckless sinning of me and my brothers. Sorry to Jesus, the second best Mexican I know, and whose portrait I used to turn around before watching porn. I'm sorry. I really am sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry to all the Mexicans shaking their heads. Disculpe me, senora. I went to school in English. Blame America. Blame our uncles and their playboys. Their white women stashed under their beds. Shout out to my cousins. Thank you for welcoming me. Thank you for welcoming me into the club of Vale Madre. I know I was a good Mexican when I went to school and finished all my homework and hid all my hurts, my hollow, my howling, my haunting, my crown of thorns bleeding silently like the best Mexicans I know. I appreciate the golf claps. <laughs> um, I'll read this poem. I went to school at Harvard University. Um, and so this is a poem inspired by being broke <laughs> at Harvard. It's called Wealth. It's after Lucille Clifton. Wealth, don't talk to me about wealth. When I got into Harvard, my guys joked it was to mow the lawns. I laughed until I met my roommates and they offered me a broom. If I accepted the broom and beat the cobwebs out of their heads, do you think I'd forget? Now I make poems in languages they can't register. You feel me? In every poem, I hide garden shears, invitations to banquets, and they still don't spell my name right. Apologies. When they say Jose, the only people to turn their heads are me and the janitors, line cooks, wait staff, yes, landscapers. Jose el Poeta y Jose the Gardener, each of us biting our tongues, trying to make beauty grow from soil covering bones, barely under the surface. <laughs> yeah, yeah, golf club is like a very polite clap. Uh, what else do I want to read you? I'll read three more poems. So the heart of this book, there were a couple of pieces of inspiration for this book, right? One was um, I wanted to, I wanted to, so here's what happened, right? I was touring for Citizen Illegal and I would go into a lot of high schools and also college classrooms. And before I would read a love poem in there, I'd be like, make some noise if you're in love. And it would be silent. <laughs> and so I was like, I guess Gen Z does not rock with love like that. Uh, so it made me think maybe there's like, maybe I could contribute something. Maybe there's room for more love, right? Maybe there's more room to, to kind of think about conversations about, about all the different types of love. And so I wanted to think about writing love poems for my friends, for my family, for my communities, um, romantic love too, but 
thinking about love expansively, right? So I'll read you some of those love poems and I'll start with uh, this poem I wrote about my brothers and the first time they met my wife. This is called Eating Taco Bell with Mexicans. <laughs> the day I introduce Erica to my brothers, I warn her, my brothers are extra Mexican. <laughs> what does that mean, she asks. I repeat, extra Mexican. When we hang out, they talk to her in English and ask her how she can love someone as ugly as me. <laughs> They're rude. <laughs> Do you have bad breath? Are your teeth fake? What's wrong with you? Why do you love our brother? They laugh in Spanish at their own jokes. They play Mario Kart and sing along to Bad Bunny. They say they're broke and blame capitalism. They say they're single and blame capitalism. <laughs> they say they're in love and blame capitalism. They ask Erica if, if she's hungry and tell her she's in luck. Erica nods. She kisses me on the cheek in a language that needs no translation. She points at me and says, he's the lucky one. My brothers laugh because she speaks their language of dumb jokes. They promise to take her to the bomb Mexican spot. The Mexican spot, Mexicans try to keep a community secret. Then they take her to Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> my brothers really do love Taco Bell. That's not a lie. They, my youngest brother, he's 10 years younger than me, Daniel. He like sent a screenshot. He got like a Crave box today. <laughs> so he was like, he's really in it. Uh, this poem, this is the next poem. This is the second and last poem I'll read for now. This poem is called Nate Calls Me Soft. Uh, and it's inspired by my friend Nate calling me soft. <laughs> Nate calls me soft. If we were better at being honest, maybe it wouldn't take a bottle of something strong to make us talk straight. Straight edge as we used to be driving around in that old Toyota Tercel from open mic to open mic. If I confess that the memory alone makes the corner of my eye itch, would you call me soft? Nate says, yes. B says, duh. Adam says, you were the softest. My therapist says, let's talk about your parents. <laughs> My brothers say, if all you're gonna do is talk, then pass the blunt. Mexican Jesus says nothing. Mercury is in reggaeton. Do the stars only talk to women? Tonight, the stars are hidden by the brash lights of the city, and I want to say my friends can see, my, can see my softness through all the jokes I crack, but maybe I don't need the stars to be tender. Maybe the next time I see you, I'll slap away the dap, pull you in close, and tell you under the ordinary streetlights how much I love you and that you still ain't shit. <laughs> Okay, uh, so this will be my last poem. Um, this is a love poem I wrote for my wife. It's called Love Poem Beginning with the Yellow Cat. Thank you all for being here. It's cool. This is my first time at Odyssey, so thank you for hosting me. Uh, yeah, love poem beginning. Oh, thank you, internet. <laughs> Anybody on Facebook? Uh, Love poem beginning with the yellow cap for Erica. I ask you, what's the first thing you think about when you see the color yellow? And like a real New Yorker, you say yellow cabs, not sunlight or a yellow ribbon tied around a vase of fresh begonias, yellow cabs honking down Broadway. I still remember the night we first shared a cab you whispered honey, whispered lace, whispered chrysanthemum. All that practice, and it turns out I had never ridden in a cab the right way. Around us, the street lights blurred into yellow ribbons. And when you put your hand on my thigh, it was like I knew for the first time why God gave us thighs, why God gave us hands. Maybe God invented yellow for the cabs, 
So the first time we touched, it would be accented in gold. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, I will try my best to answer them. Yeah. Question. Um, what were like your family's like first thoughts when you were being more honest with like how you wrote poetry? What were their first thought their first thoughts about me writing poetry? Um, well, I was I was kind of scared of what their reaction would be, in part, uh, because I knew my family wanted me to be a professional of some kind, right? A lawyer, a doctor something good like that. Uh, but honestly, um, I think I got a lot of, what, what do I wanna say? I got a lot more liberty than I thought I would because I was a boy, I think. If I was, if we had a girl in our family, I don't think she would have received that kind of, would have been allowed to pursue something like, like I was able to pursue. Um, so I think in some ways, gender roles made it easier for me to tell my parents that I was going to write and become a writer and write poetry specifically. And my parents were just like, well, what are we going to do? We can't tell, we can't say no to boys, right? That's not in the culture. Uh, and so my parents really, they, they don't fully understand what I do. This book, I should mention, uh, includes Spanish translations of all the poems. So my brother Ruben just sent me a poem, uh, not a poem, a photo today of my mom reading the poems in Spanish. And it's the first time she's ever, ever been able to read my poetry. So um, we'll see, maybe they'll, maybe they'll like love it more, but maybe they'll hate it, who knows? <laughs> I'm like a little worried. Uh, yeah, I don't know, we'll see. Yes. Where did you find the confidence to like put yourself out there? So, your um, I was super shy growing up. Um, like I remember even in math class, uh, the teacher would ask a question. And even if I knew the answer, she would never hear me. So like one of my friends would get great grades because he'd be like, the teacher be like, nobody knows the answer. And then my friend Joseph, he'd be like, the answer is X equals seven. And the teacher be like, wow, great job. And Joseph be like, that was actually, he actually said that like five minutes ago, <laughs> but he spoke so quietly, you couldn't hear him. Um, so it was definitely not in my nature to, to do anything like this would have terrified me. Um, but I, I really enjoyed watching I participated in a poetry slam club, right? Um, which I know some of you were in. And so I loved watching my friends do that. And I watched, I loved how excited they would get when they performed. And so I just kept practicing. And at first I would close my eyes because I didn't want to look at the audience. Um, and over time I grew, it just, it became a little bit easier in some ways. I still get super nervous before readings, but I've done it enough to know that nothing bad will happen, right? Like, it'll be okay. So uh, yeah, just practice, I would say. Is writing something you do like every day or is it more like you feel like writing? What does that process like for you? Setting yourself to that up? Yeah. Um, I write in kind of big chunks. So when I'm actively writing, I write every day for a month or two. And my routine is always the same. I'll make coffee in the morning. Um, we only drink Bustelo at my house. And so I'll put some Bustelo on and then I'll sit down at the computer and I'll write until I finish a poem, unless I finish a poem like in 20 minutes, then I'll try to like write another one. I'll, Cause usually I start to feel good. I'll be like, oh, I got it going. And I'll be like, maybe I could get two poems. Maybe I could get three poems. Um, and usually what I find is like, 
whatever I thought the poem was going to be is not what it is, right? But there's something there that opens a door that leads me somewhere else. And so I just kind of follow those pathways until it feels good to me, until it feels emotional. I want poems that move people, right? Um, and then when I'm not actively writing, I try to read, I try to go see movies, listen to music, all of those things, I think, feed me and kind of feed the writing. Um, so I don't write every day, but when I am writing, I try to keep a routine and I try to be consistent. You had a question. Couple. Yeah. How did you share your first poem to with whom or how? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the first poem that I wrote was like a love poem. <laughs> coming back full circle, right? It was a poem I wrote for a crush. And uh, I didn't give it to her, but I gave it to, uh, I let one of my friends read it, be like, I was like looking for feedback. And uh, he was like, I think there's a pretty good poem, but you probably should not, <laughs> did not should not do anything with it. Uh, and so that was part of it. Um, and then the first time that I read a poem out loud, it just felt there's a feeling of power that I think is special, right? I mean, especially at that time when I was 15, 16 years old, there's not too many times that you get the room to yourself to kind of go on about whatever you want, right? Um, where like the teacher has to be quiet and just listen to you. Uh, so that felt really cool to me. And, and that was just something that kept me going, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Ha, um, your, this second book here, here is in translation. Uh, why you decided to publish it also in Spanish? Were you thinking of your parents? And how much did you, or were you participating in the translation or did you let it go? This is, you know, I finished my work, and now it's the work of the translator. Yeah. Um, I decided to have this book include the Spanish translation for a couple of reasons. Um, one is my parents, right? It's, it'll make it accessible to them for the first time. Um, one of my homegirls uh, texted me today and was like, I just realized that I'll be able to have a book club with my dad for the first time, right? Which, like, yeah, I mean, when I was going to school, I could never share what I was doing with my parents. It was, you know, they they didn't read in English. And so I could show them the books, but they couldn't read alongside me, right? So that's one thing. Um, and then the other thing is that I spend a lot of time visiting schools as part of my profession. And often I'll give readings in English, but when I do workshops, sometimes the parents are invited and I'm asked specifically to do bilingual workshops, right? And every time I've done that, it's been great. Like the parents really get into it. Like I was like, you know, men and women weeping because they hadn't had the opportunity to like write some of these things, to, to like express themselves this way. And they always tell me like, you know, we wish we could read your poems, but we only read in Spanish. But you know, if you ever have a book in Spanish, we would love to read those poems. So I, those moments just stay with me and I wanted to make something that, that would be useful to them. Um, in terms of working with the translator, um, the translator is David Ruano Gonzalez, who's a friend of mine from Ciudad de Mexico. Um, we met because he translated some of my poems for a festival that I was participating in, in Ciudad de Mexico. And, um, and he did a great job. Uh, like I loved his translations. They matched the music, they matched the humor. Uh, they were really smart. Um, and so I knew he was the right person to do the translations. We did argue about certain things like, um, you know, one of the poems talks about grass, right? And he translated grass as césped, uh, which no one in my family says césped. We, we say sacate, 
Uh, and I think different people say different things, right? But I said, I grew up saying sacate. Um, and so he was like, it can't be sacate, it has to be cesped. And I was like, no, bro, <laughs> you've been, your Spanish has been ultra colonized. <laughs> Let alone, you know, Spanish is a colonial language too, right? So, uh, but I was like, you know, my, my ranch Spanish, my farmer Spanish says sacate. So it has to be sacate. That's what my parents would say. So we argued for a while. I actually don't remember who won that argument, honestly. <laughs> Uh, but we argued about little things like that. And then other things he would ask me about questions, right? Some of the poems are very Chicago centric. And so he'd be like, I don't understand this poem. Can you help me kind of make sense of it? And so there was a lot of going back and forth. Mm -hmm. So when you write, you write in English? You're thinking in English? Yeah, when I write, I write in English. Do you ever write in Spanish? Um, I've gotten more practice writing Spanish now, um, but I went to school and, you know, there were no ELL classes, right? There were no English language learners classes. Um, the first time I went to school in the United States, I was immediately sent to the principal's office. Uh, and it was because I spoke Spanish, you know what I mean? And the, the principal was basically like, Mind you, I couldn't speak English, so the principal through a translator had to hire someone to translate specifically for me because no one in the school was speaking Spanish. Uh, basically told me that I had to promise to learn English because otherwise I wouldn't be able to learn anything, right? And so my first experience was, was basically getting in trouble for speaking Spanish. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I, for a long time, I, you know, I didn't really, speak Spanish outside of the family context or with like friends. But I guess my real question then, if you wrote something in English, it's translated in Spanish, when you read it in Spanish, do you have a different feeling as, as you know, you're this, you're this, got different parts in there. So yeah, do you feel it differently when you say it in Spanish? The textures are a little different and maybe I'll try reading a poem in Spanish for you. Please. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll do that to close, but uh, the textures of the Spanish are a little different and the music is a little different, but it's still, when I read it, I still recognize it for like, uh, I can still, I still feel it. You know what I mean? It still feels mine. It doesn't feel totally disconnected. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask um, how, the experience of writing in a pandemic was and how I guess comparing it to like to your first book mm -hmm. and how that was written in that process the big difference between the first writing the first book and writing the second book is uh no one was like no one really cared about the first book until after it came out right like I didn't you know, when I wrote Citizen Illegal, I was like, maybe I'll sell five copies to like my brothers and my friends and that'll be it. Uh, but I didn't have this huge expectation of like, you know, what it might mean to people outside of that. Um, and so sitting down to write Promises of Gold, I had to work to like make a quiet space for myself, right? To kind of block out some of the noise you know, a lot of a lot of love, but also just like it's hard to write when you know you have a lot of voices in your head. Um, so that was one thing I had to learn how to kind of quiet quiet the space for myself again. Um, but then, of course, the pandemic the pandemic made it hard because I was like, I don't know if any of us are going to be here in another eight. Like, I really have no idea what's happening in the world. Uh, I definitely don't want to spend the last three months of my life or, you know, if something drastically bad happens, writing a book of poems that, you know, is never going to make it out into the world. So for a while, I was just wrecked by fear and despair. Um, and so I was kind of focused on other things, right? Just like, what do I need to do to like, stay alive and stay somewhat 
in a healthy mental space, right? Like going outside and going for walks, um, calling my friends to check up on them. Uh, so it wasn't until like year two of the pandemic um, that I got back into the practice of writing, right? And it was hard because even though I was at home a lot more than I was before, it was like all of my routines had been broken. Um, before the pandemic, I was traveling probably three times a week, but outside of those days, I knew when I would write, right? Like I had routines, I would write at a cafe down the block, I would sit down with a friend, we would write until like two or 3 p.m. and then we would go eat lunch or something. Um, and all of those routines were broken, so, uh, I don't know, I feel like I just had to remake a lot of those practices for myself. Yes. Um, I had a question about some of your formatting, like whether it's a backslash or an ampersand. Um, mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time in class, I teach citizen illegal, and um, talking about form and how the form looks on the page. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit, because I noticed in this one, in this collection too, you're using the slash again. Just sort of, kids always ask me, like, where does that come from? What does that mean? And yeah. um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that stuff. Yeah. So I like using a backslash as an alternative to a line break. A line, a line break feels like a cleaner pause, right? It, it forces your eyes to move down and then back to the left side of the page, right? Whereas a backslash, I mean, it, it signals that a break is there, but it doesn't quite move your eyes in the same way. So it's like a little bit softer of a pause. And so I use it for musical purposes. Um, and as well as like, I like how it looks. Like I, I, and that's part of the reason why I use ampersands as opposed to writing out the, the word and. Uh, it's because I like the way it looks. I think Aracelis Gilmai, uh, who I was talking to you about earlier, has a poem about the ampersand where she talks about how an ampersand looks like a little heart, right? And so I love thinking that there's all these little hearts in the poems. Can I have one quick follow up? Yeah. Um, my parents fold like luggage. Mm -hmm. Did you write that in lines before to miss the folding? Yeah, for me, part, part of that is that, but the other part is so that it's, the lines of four kind of appear like a rectangular shape, like a luggage yeah. box, like a suitcase, right? I just think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I heard it from you now. So there I you go. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, like, if and how your mindset changed now that you know, your, your work is getting out there more and it's going into classrooms and, you know, you're touring everywhere and how you kind of just change in the way of how you want to portray your poems, like when you first started to now. I mean, I think the big difference is I've always had some kind of understanding of the way poems move with an audience, right? I started writing poems to read them out loud to people. One of my first jobs was as a teaching artist in Chicago. So I would visit high schools around the Chicagoland area. And sometimes they would have an auditorium for us, but sometimes they'd be like, you, you know, the security guard would meet us and they'd be like, uh, you're not on the schedule, but, uh, there's like three classrooms eating lunch right now. So if you want, you can go read poems to them, but we don't have a microphone or anything. So good luck, right? And so we would do that. We would have to, you know, climb on top of a lunch table and we'd have basically five seconds to hook people's attention. And so I think my poems have always kind of been informed by those teaching practices, right? I think if I were to analyze my own poems, I think you would see that I like a strong opening line and a strong image to begin with. And I like a strong last line and, and an image that kind of feels like a punchline or something like that. And it's because in those spaces, you had to start strong and you had to end strong. And that's how you kind of got people's attention. And so I think I've like kept that practice. Um, I think what's changed is, um, I feel a little bit more self-conscious and so it slows me down. I think 
there's something when you are not as aware of people, you can act a little more freely. And so I, I think I have to fight to get in. I think that's what I was trying to say. Like you have to, I have to fight to get into that space where I don't feel self-conscious and start wondering like, oh, you know, will this poem work? Will it not? I have to have the confidence in my practice to really try it, right? The other thing about the pandemic is like before the pandemic, if I was working on something new, I could bring it to an open mic, you know, and see if it was, see if it was working or not. For a lot of this book, I didn't really get a chance to like take it. Like these are some of the first times that I'm reading these poems. So I don't have a feel for them yet and how they move in an audience, right? So I'm still listening to kind of see, you know, what poem is, is, is like working really well and what poem maybe is not best for performances or something like that. Any other questions? Could, could you describe the, the way you're soft? The way I'm soft? Yeah. In terms of the poem that I read or just in general? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, one of the reasons my friends make fun of me is because I'm like very prone to getting emotional uh, and like teary-eyed you know what I mean um huh you're writing a poem right now uh and so so yeah to them it's you know they they make fun of me but in like a loving way like they don't they're not actually they love that about me you know what I mean uh but because we love each other, we still have to make fun of each other, which is, I don't know if that's just us, if that's like a friendship thing in general, if it's like how Chicago people specifically, like, have you ever seen the meme that's like, you know, how Chicagoans flirt and it's somebody like cussing somebody else out. It's a, it's a whole thing. We, we're very uncomfortable saying nice things to each other. We'd much rather say mean things to one another even when we actually mean the opposite, right? When we actually mean uh, to say that we love someone. All right, I'm gonna end by reading a poem in Spanish. This is the first poem in the book. It's called Tradición. It's a poem that is translated by David Ruano González. Las historias dicen que los mexicanos surgieron de la tierra igual que los tallos del maíz. Por supuesto, no éramos mexicanos todavía. Aquello que éramos estaba perdido. No, no perdido. Sumergido, sumergido bajo el imperio. Tenido por la sangre y la pol, polvora. Pólvora. Cree lo que quieras. Tal vez si sí surgimos de la tierra. Tal vez el agave es nuestro hermano. Tal vez las montañas nuestra madre. La tradición más vieja que conozco es ver a mi papá apostarle dinero a boxeadores mexicanos sin importarle las, probabil las probabilidades. Yo no sé ustedes, pero yo soy hijo de la pérdida, de la pérdida y heredero de las perdidas, aunque no me estoy quejando. Conozco la, tra la tradición. Le apuesto todo lo que tengo a mi gente y reto al universo que nos venza. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. We have copies of uh, the book at the register if you'd like to pick one up. Uh, and we're going to have a signing table over by the main door. Um,